This video brought to you by Blinkist, an app that condenses the main lessons from non-fiction books and gives them to you in 15 minutes. This was not an accident. He was betrayed. We must do something. Okay. The King's Man is a prequel continuation of the Kingsman franchise that depicts the main events of World War I. And much like World War I, it didn't exactly go as planned. The movie made a little over 100 million at the box office with a budget of 100 million, which means that it's the first entry in the franchise to most likely have lost a bunch of money. Oops. Maybe you can blame that on the circumstances, but in general, moviegoers just didn't seem as stoked about The Kingsman as one would have hoped. And I can understand why, because the movie does often, for example, go a bit too fast for its own good. It covers such an extensive period of events that a lot of it flashes by way too quick to get a full feel for. We agree to go meet the Austrian Duke in Serbia, and then we're there, and the first thing that happens is an assassination attempt, followed by another assassination attempt right after. We meet the leaders of Europe for the first time, and then there's immediately a full-scale war. We go to the front lines, and the very first thing that happens is that there's a runner carrying evidence that can end the war. That runner was actually a British spy. Overall, the movie feels a lot like a two-hour collection of those Lego ads where the events play out in a matter of seconds. A war has broken out in Western Europe. Hey! Fill the war. Pretend like it's been going on for years with millions of casualties. Five million dead. The thing is though, lately we've covered so many movies in a negative light that it's about time for a change. And since Sony delayed No Way Home's digital release from February to March, They stole it from me! They took it! That was today! Today! That kinda leaves The Kingsman. But in a way, I think that's good. It'll be interesting to take this quote-unquote failure of a movie and try to look past its negatives to instead find some positive lessons to learn. Because it does also do quite a few great things, in terms of the villain characters, as well as the narrative through lines, as well as the way it consistently uses bad things to create good things. Maybe you're looking to use these positives to improve your own work, or maybe you're just a fan of the movie looking for arguments to convince your friends that it's actually great. Either is fine. I mean, I saw one comment on Letterboxd saying The Kingsman is the best in the series, so fair enough. Oh, and also, if you're in Letterboxd, please go like my Dead Man's Chest review. We only need a couple hundred more likes to make it number one in the world. Do it! Do it! Come on! Come on! Do it now! But yeah, let's look deeper into the positive side of The Kingsman and identify a few core things it does really well in order to hopefully find some success Anna. in failure. Follow me. The villain-related positive to learn from The Kingsman is the way it builds a recognizable cast of bad guys by assigning each of them a consistently specific identity. Essentially, the antagonist side is led by this shadowy Scottish guy who wants to ignite a world war to get Germany to destroy England as an elaborate form of payback. Has oppressed my beloved Scotland for over 700 years and it is time for retribution. And to do that, he's assembled this group of multinational henchmen, which is a problem because now we have a bunch of characters without time to delve into them, which usually would turn them into indistinguishable, forgettable noise. Except here, that doesn't happen because of labels. For example, one of the henchmen is this lowly Serbian who is best described as the assassin. His sole purposeful existence here revolves around guiding the world toward war by way of sudden shock. He can blend into crowds, he can walk right up to the target for a close surprise kill. That's what his personality and skills are confined to. I'm just a simple Serb. To better explain why that's important, look at the next two henchmen who essentially share the same identical purpose of convincing their leaders. The German advisor is someone who I would describe as the Whisperer. He's there in the right room to nudge the right people in the right direction. He can't force you physically or even mentally, but he can exist as a faint manipulative voice in your ear. Remember how Prince George used to enjoy it? It tease you about your deformities. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the Russian Rasputin is best described as the wizard. He also can push you in the right direction, but with a bit less subtlety. Whether it's by poisoning your family and comparing their health to your country's, you must pull out of the war to save your son, or by just straight up juicing you up. I'm like a boy, juice it now, bro. On top of which, Rasputin is also a master of mystic arts and movement, which means that he, on the other hand, very much is a physical force. Oh. 
As one more example before getting into what I'm getting at with all this, look at the Dutch henchman who I would label the seductress. When she wants the world to go a certain way, she gets together with the right people and then uses that as leverage. She filmed herself seducing the president and is now blackmailing us. That's where her personality and traits and skills in the context of this movie lie. Whereas when it comes to being a fighter, for example, not so much. And the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that the movie keeps these henchmen so consistently unique that they come off as uniquely recognizable. The assassin can kill but not fight. The wizard can influence but isn't very subtle. He has the Tsar under his spell. The whisperer can manipulate but not blackmail. It has sunk another American passenger ship. There are no rules in war. The seductress can seduce and that's what her character is exclusively built around. All the henchmen are so clearly faithful to their respective core labels that they can be easily distinguished as their own people. I know that might seem obvious when done right, but if you've seen other movies, you've seen it done wrong. The henchman in No Time to Die is a young poser, but his skills and personality don't specialize in that area enough. He ultimately becomes just a generic guy with fists and a gun. <laughs> Almost all the female characters in 355 can do the same things regardless of who they are, to the point where you can't even tell them apart. Even the main villain here is sold as this big imposter, Morton. But then that ultimately doesn't carry value because it's not necessary for him to be an imposter, because he can coerce others and shoot guns and physically fight like any basic bad guy. But at least everything about him and his actions are still tied to him having no honor, which does give him some specificity. This gentleman shite! Obviously, characters shouldn't be just their label. If you have time, you should always delve deeper into the person underneath it. But in general, it is very useful to first identify your villains and heroes with a couple words and then start building their personality and skills and methods and goals exclusively around those words. Because exclusive specific uniqueness is what the audience can recognize and remember your character for. The narrative-related positive to learn from the Kingsman is the way it carries specific ideas and elements throughout the story to maintain a sense of focused progress. Before getting into what I mean with this, I first want to distinguish it from setup and payoff. When our main hero Oxford flies a plane at the start and then infiltrates the villain's base with that plane at the end, that's setup and payoff. When the hero's son Conrad practices combat at the start and then uses the same moves later, that's setup and payoff. These are individual occurrences that show up in a couple places to produce a short sense of satisfaction. Well, if God wanted man to fly, he would have given him wings. And I'll fly the plane over the mountain and Shola will jump out. But that's it. What I mean here are more continuous narrative aspects that get pushed through the entire movie to serve many purposes. Like for example the main theme, which is introduced at the start when Oxford is delivering Red Cross supplies to a POW camp until an ambush gone wrong claims the life of his wife and leads him to make one last promise. Protect our son. Never let him see war again. Promise. This thematic exploration of pacifism and parental protection serves as a sort of engine for a lot of what happens in the movie. When Conrad has grown up, Oxford's protection has become an issue. You seem to have a problem with Conrad traveling there. Or anywhere, for that matter. When the war ignites, answering the Call of Duty is the key disagreement in the relationship between Oxford and Conrad. I don't care! I should be fighting! It's not fighting, it's dying! When toward the end, Oxford finally realizes that his uncompromising protective pacifism has grown into a harmful flaw. Because it led to Conrad having to use a false name in the army and then being shot as a spy. That's the thing he overcomes to overcome the opposition. <laughs> Good to have you back, sir. 
It's a bit difficult to explain this without showing the full movie, but the point I'm getting at is that the contents of most of the scenes originate from this theme. The theme serves as the primary source for all the conflict and obstacles and character choices, and so on, so on. I'm still young enough to believe it's an honorable thing to die for one's country. And millions have died pointlessly. Which is important because now what we have here is one united movie. Now we're pushing one main boulder for 100 meters instead of seven main boulders for five meters everything seems to serve a joint progressive purpose. I shouldn't let you fall. Only now I have become the man that my son would have been. Even in smaller moments, characters don't waste time by chatting whatever shit, but instead... So you're serious about being a soldier? Oh yeah. Which regiment? Grenadiers. Thing you need to make sure though is that the boulder actually progresses. You can't go around in frustrating circles. Whenever you explore the same thing, it always has to lead to some form of a next step. Like when Conrad keeps bothering Oxford about joining up and then through that we learn the origin of his pacifism. That he grew tired of killing after doing it too much. As long as the boulder keeps moving, you have one movie with a constant sense of progress. To explain it further with a smaller example, take the narrative element of Oxford's secret agency using service people to keep track of what's going on. Domestic servants everywhere who are seen but not heard. Unless they're part of the Oxford family, of course. This exists mostly to deliver a viral plot exposition, but it doesn't feel like it because it's made into something more. The information isn't stuffed in our face by simply suddenly saying that, oh yeah, we have a spy there and here's what they heard. But rather, we spend time on the service people element throughout the movie and are then rewarded with the information it produces. We put in time and effort to push this one thing and we get something back as a result. How do you know that? Oh, Sam, you a good guy. Nanny's legendary big world tarps, laced with poison. Do you think we can extend our network to the White House? My character finds it much easier to be involved unnoticed, just like domestic servants everywhere. And do we have someone in the embassy? Of course. Or as an even smaller example, look at the villain's goats, which play a key supportive role in the grand scheme of things. They're the thing that highlights the villain's personality and how he views others. And they follow my commands blindly. They're the thing that leads Oxford to the villain's base. Kashmir from the Camelero goat. They're the thing that demonstrates the central question of reputation versus character. Reputation is what people think of you. Character is what you are. The villain on the outside is a goat farmer, but he doesn't treat them accordingly. Whereas Oxford on the outside is a high nobleman, yet he still treats these dirty animals with respect. That's what we learn through the goats. As in, we spend all this time on the goats in various contexts and we gain a lot of gratifying stuff in return. point is, identify a few key narrative elements or ideas and then push them through the whole story to do different bigger things, like this movie does with the King Arthur code names, which it had to originate. That's the thing that allows young Conrad to understand the world. King Arthur and his knights had a round table because it meant that all men were equal. It's important that people born into privilege lead by example. But that's the thing that adult Conrad uses as a wink to his family. According to Conrad, I'm Lancelot. And I'm requesting an audience with King Arthur. That's the thing that Oxford names his agents after in order to honor his fallen son. The movie constantly evolves this one small thing as a sort of narrative throughline to be the source of many meaningful things, instead of pulling it into existence out of nowhere in the very moment where it's needed. Gotta say, it's fantastic. Guys, I got it. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> The third positive lesson to take from The Kingsman is the way it consistently uses negative things to build very effective, positive results. This plan hasn't exactly gone by the numbers. A great showcase of this is how all the most meaningful character choices and changes here come from bad things. Oxford's flaw of overprotection is born from the promise he makes to his dying wife, and it's important because he promised his dying wife. Oxford's choice to include Conrad in his business and do something about Rasputin is born from the killing of the general, and it's important because after the general, there's no one else left to do it. Oxford's final decision to go fight to end the war with nothing held back is born from Conrad's death. And it's important because we're not just doing it, we're doing it for Conrad. America will have to join the war. Conrad.
If this choice and changes came from nothing bad, if Oxford was keeping Conrad locked up and trying to save the world just because he's a good guy who loves life or whatever, nobody would care. But thanks to the negative origins, we do care. Because as in real life, people's journeys are always at their most emotionally powerful when they're fueled by mistakes and tragedies. Warned me. I, I, I didn't listen. I didn't even get to say goodbye. I suggest we solve both our problems. Another way the movie uses negatives is to increase the sense of stakes and challenge. When Russia finally exits the war to allow Germany to focus its full might on Britain, that gives us a feeling of being in the end game. That England is doomed. When Conrad runs off to join the front lines, that gives us a feeling of urgent necessity to end the war before it ends him. And there's hope for Conrad. When we're heading to Russia with the plan of killing Rasputin by making him eat this poison cake, and then he eats the poison cake and simply pukes it out like bad cheese, that gives us a feeling of oh. Shit. Now what? If you really knew my reputation, you'd know I'd take a little point. point is that the more things deviate from plan and go wrong, and the bigger the perceivable obstacles grow, the less confident the audience will feel about achieving success. Each mistake and setback tears a new hole in the metaphorical safety net, and once there's more holes than net, that's where you'll find real uncertainty and dread. Your kick did not agree with me. And another way this movie uses negatives is to build overall excitement for individual scenes, which happens for example when Oxford is attempting to parachute to the villain's base from his plane. Since it would be pretty lackluster to see all this play out exactly as intended, it doesn't. Something goes wrong. Which not only leads to this really intense problem of breaking free from the plane before it's too late, but also to this nerve-wracking Modern Warfare 2 sequence where Oxford has to climb this icy wall before there is no more icy wall. All of which was made possible simply because of a bad occurrence. One thing you have to make sure though is that the negative occurrence is organic. When the rope here suddenly slips for no pre-established reason whatsoever, it kind of feels like it happens just because the rider made it so, which does take away from this otherwise awesome sequence. So as long as you can keep it organic, go for it. Because as per the human nature, the only thing more exhilarating than a man running across a battlefield to make up with his father is if he also has to carry another man on his back and worry about a thousand Germans trying to tear him down. Overall, whether we're talking about character choices or scene excitement or anything else, it can be very useful as a filmmaker to think with the mindset of what's the worst negative thing that can happen here. Because as this movie shows, odds are it will make what's happening that much more effective. I don't know if that makes the Kingsman good or its loss of money less painful, but along with the other stuff we've talked about today, it is something very positive from something negative that you can use. As one last thing though, I know a lot of you watch these videos like today to try and learn a couple things from movies in a short amount of time. But what if I told you that you can do the same thing with non-fiction? What if I told you that you can take this 200 page book about using digital marketing to find success on the internet and learn its main lessons in just 15 minutes? Well, the thing that makes this possible is Blinkist, this cool app that gathers all the key points from non-fiction books and condenses them into these 15-minute blinks that you can either read or listen to without having to go through any extra filler. Which is the perfect positive thing for 2022, where, negatively enough, often even a tweet that's over three lines is a crime. I'm it, Bolton. How much do you expect a man to read? Whatever it is you want to learn, Blinkist library has got you covered, with thousands of titles ranging from science to history to investing to career success to even true stories and everything else. So if you wish to understand key ideas from books in a shorter time, Blinkist is sponsoring a special 25% off Filmento discount with a free 7-day trial. Check it out with the link below. Thanks.